Uh, good evening. Looks like uh, we got a full house tonight, so uh, and it's the uh, top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, uh, uh, good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever uh, wherever you are, and uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, just uh, one uh, one quick reminder: um, no class next week. Okay. And then we'll resume on the uh, 29th of uh, November. So um, just uh, if you uh, log on, uh, I'm not going to be here. However, um, if you do have any, uh, if you need to contact me um, by email or whatever, you need to talk to me, I will be available. Okay, so let's just go down the roll real quick. And uh, uh, Judith, uh, how are you this evening? Good evening, sir. All right. Doing well? Doing well, sir. Good. Yourself? Doing well. Doing well, thank you. And let's see. And uh, Jay? Doing good. How about yourself? Yeah, I can't complain. Wouldn't do any good anyway. <laughs> I can, but nobody would listen. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, Matthew, hope you're doing well. Let's see. And uh, Megan? Doing good, sir. How are you? Good. Is uh, everybody in the Eastern time zone, or do we have anybody in other uh, other time zones? All right. I'm in another time zone. Oh, what time zone are you in? CAT. Which one? I'm sorry. Central African time. Oh, so you're in Africa. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. What? Uh, where? Where in? Uh, where in Africa are you? I'm in South Africa. Oh, South Africa. What? Uh, what part? Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Okay. All right. I had, uh, had relatives there, I, yeah, at one time. All right, very good. I didn't know we had somebody from, uh, so what time is it over there? It's 3 a.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, uh, I, it, uh, that's pretty good. That was, um, I know that's a challenge. All right, uh, let's see, did I, Megan, did, we, did I say hello to you? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. And uh, Tikala, I see you're in uh, South Africa. And uh, Cameron? Good evening, Professor. How are things going? Going well. Good, good. Anything exciting going on with the project? Um, No, not at the moment. It's been a... Uh... <clears throat> Very busy work week for both okay. Edgar and myself. So <laughs> okay, all right. Hello, Edgar. Good evening, Professor. How are things going? Uh, at least uh, now we're starting to get a little bit chilly instead of uh, having the ninety hundred plus temperatures on the daily. So it's it's a nice fall time right now. Yeah, where where, where are you? Uh, Phoenix. Oh, along Phoenix. With Oh, okay. Yeah, it's gotten to cool off a little bit. Nice time of the year. We, uh, okay, we were yeah, it was we were down there. Was it last November? It's pretty nice. All right. Uh, let's see. And uh, Ron. Good evening, sir. How you good, doing? Good. Uh, How are you doing? Degrees in Boston. Oh, okay. Seven degrees. In All right. You're up uh, up in the north there, Boston. All right. And uh, Dave. Good evening. Good. Good. How's things going with uh, team variation with your project? We're doing good. Okay, good. And uh, Daniel, am I pronouncing that correctly? It's Danielle. Danielle, I'm sorry. How are things going? It's going pretty good. All right, good. And uh, Sam? Hey, sir. How are you? Good. Good. All right. Just a couple of things and we'll get uh, ro rolling. Um, I may have noticed uh, I've done a little uh, 
upgraded some of the work. I'm using, um, to evaluate your work, I'm using what we call uh, grading rubrics. I don't know if you've used them in any of the other uh, courses, but um, I think they're beneficial. Uh, I think it's a beneficial tool because it gives you uh, the criteria that uh, we're looking for in the assignment. And it also provides you, I think, with more effective t feedback and uh, gives me also a more objective uh, of method of evaluation. And they are also copies of the rubrics on the uh, under course materials. They're in Excel spreadsheets. So I meant to uh, talk about that last time, but uh, anyhow. Um, anybody have any, uh, before we get uh, rolling here, anybody have any questions, comments? Okay, Just hang on one second. Okay, so um, last week we... Um, Left off on slide 59 of uh, of um, of lesson one, so we'll go ahead and finish that, and then uh, go into lesson two. And once again, um, have any questions, uh, questions, or any uh, thing that you want to share that's related to the material? Please, uh, please feel free to jump right in. Also, as I mentioned last time, if there's some if I'm going a little too fast and you, and you need uh, further explanation, uh, you know, go ahead and slow me down because there may be some material that I might I might not think that's all that important, but it may be to you, or you may have, or you just may need some clarification. So once again, uh, you know, if you have to, put the brakes on, and uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, go through it. So anyway, this is the appendix. Uh, this is basically just uh, discussing some of the uh, symbols and the and uh, and building a uh, value stream map, which uh, you'll be doing. So I don't think this is going to um, take too long to go through. But like I said, once again, uh, stop me if you have any questions. So and these are uh, you know some of the basic symbols. Um, you can. Uh, you can certainly use this as a reference uh, guide if you're uh, doing flow charts. So I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily uh, read these to you, but uh, these are the ones that you see are some of the more common uh, mapping symbols in, in terms of values. Not so, maybe not so much on flow charts, but uh, really, it, but more in a, in a value stream mapping, value stream mapping, which we'll be doing for this course. And uh, this is basically the uh, FIFO and LIFO, that's first in f uh, and last in, first out. That's basically the order in which material is handled. And it's, also an, uh, it's also accounting terminology for uh, valuing uh, inventory. But uh, for the purpose of this course, it's basically the order in which uh, material is handled. Okay, and uh, different organizations have, uh, have different policies as far as using uh, whether they use FIFO or LIFO, and it said some of it is accounting uh, related the way it, the inventory is reported on a balance sheet. Uh, next one is a supermarket symbol for a Kanban, and that's just a transport symbol. And uh, this is basically a uh, withdrawal from a uh, supermarket. <laughs> and that's a withdrawal card from a Kanban. And this, uh, you'll, you'll, the data box, um, you should have already have uh, done this in your hand-drawn um, value stream map, but that's the data box that's uh, used to record information during a for a particular pro uh, process or a sub-process. So there they list the uh, cycle time is one hour, uh, the lead time is three days, and the batch and the minimum and minimum batch. If you have the right um, software like iGraphics or something similar, it actually um, it automatically uh, populates that information for you. If not, you have to do it by hand. And this is a push arrow over using uh, uh, using a push uh, um, 
methodology in, in production and the uh, burst there is a uh, is a Kaizen. Um, also, uh, I've seen also those bursts used just to point out uh, maybe a, a potential quick win or some other type of uh, activity that you want to bring to the uh, to the uh, uh, attention of your uh, of your audience. But for um, for um, value stream map, it's uh, basically for a Kaizen, and we're going to get more into uh, the Kaizen events uh, later on in the uh, in the course. And that's just a couple more. Whoops. Once again, a Kanban. Uh, that's uh, kind of the spectacles or the, the, the used for go see and production scheduling, load leveling, and also with uh, and, the, and the upside down triangle is for batching. And that's for operator, buffer stock, and the information flow. And that's usually electronic. Um, Generally speaking, I mean, a lot of information now is uh, transmitted electronically and not too much uh, is done by uh, snail mail anymore. So that could even that could refer to an email or some other type of uh, electronic transfer of information. Email, fax, anything like that, phone, instant messaging. And that's just manual communications might be uh, paper based. And then the next one is a Kanban post, uh, pull ball, and then and the uh, process bo box. And that's uh, the process box is, is uh, in a value stream map, you're going to definitely use a, uh, is a, a process back. It's just, uh, equal, as it says here, it equals one area of a flow. It's just one uh, part of the uh, uh, one process or a sub process. So it, uh, it, and it, and each one of these process boxes represents the, the tasks that are used to complete a part or assembly in your in your value stream mapping. So you would label it, you would label a box on, you know, what the process is, painting, uh, drilling, uh, might be uh, in, in a, maybe in an office environment, uh, possibly uh, paying an invoice, something like that. And that's your, um, this is the basics of putting together a value stream map. So you can see that the, the three different uh, process steps, stamping, welding, uh, and then the welding, uh, the second uh, welding area. And in between are your wait times and then the inventory or probably a work in process. And here they're... Um, this is the we're building the value stream map, and they they call the bottom the castle step. Uh, once again, if uh, you have the right software, it's all uh, it it would be um, automatically uh, it would automatically be populated. But not if not, you just do it do it do it manually. So you can see the stamping process is uh, three minutes. Uh, the welding is fifteen. So the whole, the actual process time, or the value, what we also would call the value-added activity, would be 23 minutes, just simply adding up the three, uh, <clears throat> the times for the three different uh, processes. And then uh, you add the, you have the wait time. So there's 65 minutes between stamping and welding, and then uh, 180 minutes between weld number one and weld number two. So. <clears throat> and that course comes out to 245 uh, 45 minutes. And that generally is uh, probably non-value added time. And if you're uh, leaning out a process, you would certainly want to put on your uh, lean glasses and or lean microscope and really look at those areas to see, you know, why the, it's, it's taking that long and why there uh, is a, a work in, uh, you know, a, a work in process. So that would be an area you'd want to focus on. And that's one of the reasons we do a value stream map. So the total wait time, once again, uh, simple math, 245 minutes. So the total, uh, total process time is uh, 245, is 245 minutes. And the actual process time is uh, 23 minutes. Okay. So it, just 10% of the uh, total time, 10% of the time is actually value added, which is not unusual. So actually the entire process is, uh, it's 200, you would add 245 minutes 
plus 23 minutes, which is 268 minutes. So basically, that your wait time, which is 245 minutes, you know, the individual process, the time for the three individual process of 23 minutes. So the entire uh, process, really, it, it, or the entire lead time is 268 minutes. And of course, as I mentioned before, this is the 245 minutes is the non-value added time, and that's the area you'd really want to examine closely in the in a uh, if you're leaning out this particular uh, value stream. And the value added time is the time when the work is actually getting done. That's the uh, 23 minutes. That's when you know the stamping, the welding, and everything is taking uh, place. And uh, you would get these times by uh, Initially, you might do it by uh, by estimating the amount of time, or actually uh, uh, gathering the data and uh, uh, observing the process, gathering the data to compute the amount of uh, time that it's taking in those individual. Uh, whoa, hang on one second. Reschedule. Ooh, wants to do an update. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so that's your value added time, 23 minutes. And like I said, less than 10% of the uh, total uh, lead time. Not that unusual. Many uh, uh, many processes, if they're uh, if, the, if the value uh, added time is 10% of the total uh, total lead time, that's really not that bad. Okay. So you have an eight, once again, 23 divided by 268 is an 8.6, almost 9% of the uh, total time is, uh, is value added. Not unusual at all. But wait, there is more. So you have, and so here in this particular case, they're they're including a rework loop, which is adding time to the process. So it adds another 65 minutes to it. So now your ratio is down to seven percent. You've got some rework. Maybe uh, there was uh, maybe once it went to welding, it was rejected for some reason and had to go back to stamping. Once again, uh, as process improvement. Uh, uh, in the area of process improvement, you want to find out why this rework is happening, how often it's rework, you know, and how often it's uh, this rework is uh, is uh, is occurring. Once again, you want to know if it's a con if there's a common cause or a special cause that's uh, causing the rework loop, and you might want to know the amount of times it's happening, the percentage of times that it's happening, or the percentage uh, of rejects. Uh, from the uh, well department. And these are just some supplement. Any questions on uh, on the constructing on the uh, on the value stream maps? Okay, it's pretty well explained. Uh, I, I think the book uh, Learning to See does a really good job of uh, of explaining it to it. So. Um, it's uh, probably the best book I've seen on uh, value stream mapping. So uh, I would uh, certainly, uh, that's certainly a valuable uh, reference. So as you can see also, so you added that, uh, that 65 minutes back in, which, may, which took so the whole uh, process 336 minutes. So what I've said, it brought it down to about an 8% ratio. And uh, just... Uh, Overproduction, uh, what does the customer think when they receive a product that doesn't uh, work? Um, you know, basically, in overproduction, uh, you're uh, producing something uh, maybe uh, that's really not needed, or uh, and um, it's um, it may be uh, producing more than it's required by the next process. So, um, 
once again, uh, to it, and, and usually, and it usually uh, overproduction is definitely non-value uh, added because you're providing something that really wasn't needed in the first place. And and you know, and uh, not only in manufacturing, uh, you might be uh, creating a report that uh, maybe has more data that that than the end user wants. So once again, very important to get the uh, voice of the customer to avoid uh, overproduction. And and those are some of the uh, Causes uh, just in case uh, misuse of automation. Uh, sometimes you use misuse automation; it, uh, it spits out more data than you uh, than you need. And once again, that uh, that might be an example of uh, of overproduction. Uh, long process setup, uh, unlevel scheduling, uh, unbalanced workload, over engineering. Uh, you kind of uh, in your book on the Toyota production system, uh, you were uh, uh, I don't, they talk about how uh, you know, the Porsche was probably over-engineered and, that, uh, and how Toyota went in there and helped uh, uh, provided them some, uh, some guidance and also uh, redundant inspections. So that might also be... Uh, so basically, it could include sending the wrong parts, misidentification of parts, dan- damaged or incorrect parts. And uh, once again, uh, it... Uh, what happens is the end result you have an unhappy uh, you have an unhappy customer. And when we talk about customers, of course, we're talking not only external customers, but we're also talking um, internal customers too. And then we have uh, excess inventory or work in process, uh, and. Uh, so basically, uh, what's it is is caused a lot of factors: poor demand forecasting, uh, processes with long cycle uh, with long cycle time. Um, also, you know, the first bullet protecting the company from ineff- inefficiency and unexpected problems. So sometimes they uh, people are, con- are will order excess inventory because their feeling is, well, we if we don't order this stuff now. Or you know, it may be due to a lack of confidence with the supplier. Hey, if, if we don't, if we better order more of what we need now because we may not be able to get it when we really need it. So that would be an example of, uh, of you know, anticipating inefficiencies or unexpected problems. Uh, product complexity. Uh, maybe uh, you may have uh, several different uh, product lines that require a, a lot of varieties uh, of uh, uh, a variety of inventory. Unleveling uh, scheduling, uh, bad forecasting, once again, uh, unbalanced workload. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, unreliable shipments by suppliers, lack of confidence in, in, the, in your supplier. You know, we better get it now because it may not be available tomorrow. And I understand, I know, and of course, communications and things like that. And uh, in some cases, uh, it's, it, you, um, you need, uh, sometimes you just, you you may need excess inventory. Uh, for instance, uh, I think we've got in, you know in the military uh, sometimes you have what they call war stocks. It may be uh, MREs or uniforms that uh, or other types of equipment that they may never use, but they still have to have it on. They still have to have it. Uh, in the stock, in case uh, the unexpected happens, because and I think somebody mentioned that in uh, in our uh, discussion question. Um, I forgot who that was, but um, maybe you can give us a little more insight into that. Yeah, that, that was me. Okay, that was a really Jay. good. That was a very good example, by the way. Yeah, well, like you said, we we've got a lot of stuff in these warehouses or undisclosed locations that they've been there. I've been in the military 24 years and they've been there 30, 40 years. And it's just been there. Some, a lot of it, we've went and opened some of them and they're at different bases and they're outdated. You, we can't even use them anymore, but they've been stocked them up. To, like you said, just in case. Right. And people forget about it. I mean, that's just a perfect example of the evils of excess inventory. Um, you know, it not, you know, unless it's a batch of wine or something, it doesn't get better with age. <laughs> heck, I remember when I was in the, um, I was in the uh, reserves, Army reserves. I was in in the 1970s, 
And uh, those are the days when we still use C rations. This is before the uh, MREs. Yes, and, sir. Yeah, they were they were quite delicious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, a good but, thing they they do last 50, 60 years. They oh don't well, they taste did. Good, the but... ones we had were from the Korean War. Okay. <laughs> they were, uh, yeah, they were in, from the early fifties. Uh, I didn't get. Uh, I'm still. We're still having this conversation, so I, I didn't die from it. But uh, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, that, you know, that's a good example. And he, people forget about it. And it's, in, you know, it's in a warehouse somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if, uh, there's old uniforms and things like that. So but uh, and I remember uh, some years ago, they actually um, the, the general accounting office did a study as far as uh, food deliveries for the uh, commissaries and the dining facilities. And because they were also warehousing a lot of the dry goods. And uh, they actually found that it, w- it would be more efficient to have a local uh, food service company like Cisco or somebody like that uh, sure. provide uh, you know, food, for, uh, um, you know, uh, consumables for the commissaries and for the uh, dining facilities. So and uh, I'm sure uh, anybody else have any examples of uh, uh, in their world of work uh, dealing with uh, outdated or excess inventory? You know, in uh, in retailing, uh, stuff gets uh, you get uh, stuff gets pigeonholed in a in a, in a back room, and uh, people forget about it, and then uh, they have to the retailer has to mark it down, and uh, which which affects their profit, especially in the fashion business, um, uh, especially in uh, in women's ready to wear, things go out of style really fast, so something gets uh, pigeonholed somewhere in the stock room. They may have to mark it down to uh, next to nothing. So a lot of examples of excess inventory, not only in manufacturing, but in also uh, obviously in the government and military, and also in the you know in the retail business. Now what's interesting in uh, in the world of accounting, inventory is considered an asset. Okay, so people you know look at a balance sheet, and you know you can see the uh, assets uh, exceed the uh, liabilities. But in, in essence, uh, carrying too much inventory is uh, is, in, is 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 generally a, a a bad thing. So you'd also have to look if you're looking at a company's inventory. You'd also want to look at how many times they're turning it. If they're not uh, turning, especially in terms of a retailer, that means they're not uh, they're not getting their sales, and eventually that inventory is going to be written, written down. So there are a lot of consequences uh, to having uh, uh, excess. Uh, Inventory and of course the cost warehousing it and, and things like that. And that's probably one of the weaknesses in our accounting system is, is showing inventory, uh, you know, as an a- asset. But that's just uh, we're dealing with um, financial rules and regulations. So um, waiting and delay, uh, you know, waiting for information, waiting for equipment. Uh, those are all examples of uh, delay, both in manufacturing and in, in, in the uh, and in the service sector. So uh, some of the same problems you see waiting and delay you've seen in the other areas: unbalanced workload, uh, unplanned uh, maintenance, uh, setup times. Uh, once again, uh, um, misuse of automation, quality problems, and unlevel uh, scheduling. So uh, you know over. Uh, Production, you know, generate, uh, generates extra equipment and work time, also wasted energy, extra pallets, skits, handling containers, and things like that. So there are a lot of um, a, a lot of non-value added activity in waiting delay, and a lot of times it's kind of a hidden thing because if you don't really drill down and look at it, you you, you don't realize how uh, you know how bad it is. And, and once again, in, in an office environment. Uh, uh, you may, uh, maybe uh, you have an accounts payable clerk, maybe uh, waiting for a, uh, a receiving report before being able to pay an invoice. So, and if you don't pay, especially in terms of the government, if you don't pay the invoice in, in time, after, in 30 days, there's interest penalty payments involved. So waiting and delays in both manufacturing, service, uh, back office operations, uh, can ge- can generate a lot of expense, but a lot of times it's it's hidden. 
excess motion, uh, motion of workers, transport, things like that. Um, um, once again, uh, poor layouts, uh, non-standardized work methods, uh, a bad layout, a facility layout, poor workplace organization, uh, maybe people having to, you know, in an office environment, uh, maybe people having to uh, walk to the other side of the office just to uh, you know, make a copy or pull something off a fax machine, even though I know that's probably more like in the 1990s, but things like that. Um, so sometimes it's a good idea to, uh, to do a, a motion study. And uh, one of the uh, deliverables for the program will be a spaghetti diagram. So you'll actually be doing, uh, you'll actually be doing that. So yes. I have a question. Why would you see this as a waste uh, or excess motion? Can it be for some organization deemed necessary that, you know, um, it's, for example, depending on where you're working, that you have to walk, walk across the hall to pick up a copy from the copy machine or a printer or print out. So I think depending on the organization, sometimes it's necessary, not so much an excess motion. Oh, yeah. It could, yeah, it may, it, there may be a good business reason for it. But uh, at least, um, I mean, it still has to be uh, has to be recognized. And a lot of times, this may not even come out until you get a, a work group together. Okay, uh, let's say you're, uh, you know, having a uh, let's say a process improvement meeting with members of a work team. That may not even come to the forefront until you get people in in a situation in an environment where they can. Uh, where they can bring this up. Hey, you know, I'd get this done faster, but I'm constantly uh, going across the building to do such and such. So, like I said, hey, a lot of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, just making a comment on what she just said. Yeah. Um, we have a brand new building. We got had brand new building built up, and we've probably got about 12 offices in there. Instead of ordering 12 printers for each office, we've got two. Mm -hmm. And we put them, they're centrally located. So most of our, everybody has to get up and walk to that printer. Right. You know, that's motion, but it, I guess it's kind of necessary. You might be losing time in one area, but we're saving money in another area. Yeah, that that's true. You know, everything, you know, you've got to also do, and that's a good point, uh, Jay. You, uh, you know, there's also a cost benefit involved also. Maybe, it, you know, maybe now there, there also may be, maybe less demand for a hard copy than there used to be. And uh, you're right. I mean, having uh, printers all over the place is an expense. Sure. Paper, having somebody to uh, have to fill the, uh, fill the copiers, uh, then you have to have a service contract, and then the copier breaks and things like that. Oh, you know, definitely. And I just use that, uh, I, you know, a, a, as an example. But that's, that's a very good point. Um, maybe, uh, you know, it's it may be cheaper in the long run for people to have to get up and uh, get get uh, and get their copy. But once again, that it's a cost benefit and uh, you know cost benefit uh, analysis, and it may even require uh, uh, you know some kind of a uh, outside consulting firm to look at the whole uh, process flow. Good point. And transportation, um, once again, uh, kind of similar to, uh, to uh, excess motion. Um, and in many cases, it doesn't add any value to the, uh, to the product. Uh, could also be a poor plant layout. Uh, maybe the uh, uh, warehouse is a uh, considerable distance from the manufacturing floor. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different reasons there. Uh, poor understanding of the process flow for production, and that's maybe, and that would be uh, maybe a uh, doing a value stream map or a flow chart might be a, a remedy for that. Uh, large bat sizes, long lead times, and large storage areas, and also those also add costs. And uh, we'll discuss later that uh, uh, we want to, in, in a good uh, pull system, we want to avert, try to eliminate batching as uh, as much as possible. And also the use of uh, safety and buffer stock. And that also gets back to uh, 
excess inventory because once again you maybe uh, have uh, have uh, supplier concerns so you're ordering ex excess inventory so there's no possibility of running out because uh, you may not have a reliable source of supply and uh, your supplier may be a uh, maybe a long distance away okay and that also would uh, increase your transportation costs in fact um, here in uh, in southeastern Virginia, in the <clears throat> Norfolk, Virginia, we had an F-150 um, Ford production plant, and it was one of the better ones in the company. But they, uh, one of they, they, they wound up shutting it down, not because of poor quality or poor sales. It was just too far away from the sources of supply, so they, uh, they, they did away with it. So you know, transportation was a issue there, and they felt it was just uh, they could move the production. I think they moved it to Kansas or something, which was closer to the source of supply than uh, here, where we're on the uh, right on the uh, east coast, quite a bit of distance away from uh, Detroit and those uh, areas. Of course, uh, what uh, gets a you know defects and errors. Um, that's pure waste uh, and causes uh, angst with with your uh, customers. So, um, and uh, usually uh, the causes, yeah, poor uh, poor quality as a result of poor process control, uh, uneven inventory levels, uh, the uh, maybe the plant maintenance isn't what it should be, uh, poor training, product design. Uh, not getting good requirements from the customer, you know, and uh, lack of standardized work. So those are uh, just just many different, it's just some of the causes of uh, defects and, uh, and errors. And of course, uh, <clears throat> a customer, whether an internal or external customer, getting a defective product is probably uh, very high on the list of, uh, of uh, customer complaints. And also, uh, <clears throat> also holds true for the service industry uh, or back office operation, uh, making an incorrect payment to a vendor, underpaying a vendor. That would certainly be considered a uh, uh, would be we can be considered a defect, or um, or um, say uh, yeah, that would that would be that would be an example. Um, or in terms of a uh, retail department store uh, unknowingly selling a defective merchandise, so those are those are examples not only in manufacturing but in the service and the retailing industries, <coughs> and restaurants. <coughs> Excuse me. You order a well done steak and it comes out rare. Well, that's that's a defect also, and that certainly causes waste because it has to go back to the kitchen, thrown out, and then another one has to be prepared. So, as an, uh, certainly another example of a <clears throat> defect and um, and errors. Extra processing. Um, once again, that's kind of like overproduction, and a lot of the same. Uh, a lot of the same causes for the, uh, an extra processing as we saw for some of the other uh, wastes. <clears throat> Underutilizing people, and that's many times that's not recognized as a weight, but um, certainly not using people, you know, human resources. Everybody says our people are our most important resource, but are you using them to their fullest capacity? Are you taking advantage of their abilities? Um, and once again, uh, that could be poor training, uh, not hiring the right people, uh, l l low or no investment in training. I mean, what happens with budgets get cut? One of the first things that gets cut is training, okay? And then uh, also a, uh, keeping pay low and having a high uh, turnover strategy. And then in some, uh, in, in some industries like fast food, that's kind of built into the, uh, into the equation. But um, so it, it, it really depends on the uh, depends on the industry. But uh, we spend a lot of money uh, recruiting and onboarding people. And then if we don't uh, utilize them properly, it's really a, a waste to the organization. And once again, it may not be something 
it may not be something that's uh, that's obvious, but uh, it may uh, it, once again by uh, you may find out about it by just observation and also uh, by uh, interviewing people, doing employee surveys, and that uh, and that sort of thing, doing climate surveys. Yeah, of course, people waste. Uh, giving people uh, make work on appropriate tasks, waiting time, wasted motion, things like that, equipment that doesn't work. And then uh, process waste, uh, process downtime, uh, variability, waste resources, unneeded supervision or monitoring, just uh, uh, changes to processing that's not uh, that hasn't proven to have a good ROI, or maybe there hasn't been any kind of a cost benefit and cost benefit analysis uh, done. But uh, since we're all in the area of process improvement, our goal is to uh, minimize process waste. That's uh, that's why we're here for, and that's uh, your, and uh, in your projects, most of you or in all your projects, you should be uh, looking at uh, process waste. Okay, these are just other areas, scheduling. Uh, yeah, workaround is a, a big one. Um, you have systems that don't work, so people start developing work workarounds to try to get the job done. Uh, maybe they're getting uh, inadequate uh, information, uh, lack of direction, and uh, and usually what uh, the problem with with these workarounds is it's it's non-standard work. So you might have uh, five people doing the same task, but it's not standardized. They don't have the uh, the system is broken, so everybody's doing it their own way. So when you bring people on board and you try to get them trained, uh, everybody's learning. It, it kind of uh, spreads because uh, now you've got a new generation or new workers also uh, doing these uh, doing these workarounds. And I would, uh, I would suggest that uh, in some organizations, what they call innovation is actually uh, a workaround, maybe because uh, inadequate IT systems, inadequate databases, things like that. Then information wastes, um, handoff of information, uh, data overload, uh, overload, trying to go through uh, reams of data when you're just look, you know, kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, poor, poor data. Uh, and my old uh, Lean Six Sigma um, instructor he always used to say, all data, and he used to say, in God, uh, what did he used to say, uh, all data is suspect. OK, so and many times we have organizations that are um, data rich but information poor. And that leads to uh, inaccurate data, which can lead to poor decision, uh, decision making. Um, double entry of data into systems, spreadsheets and reports. I, I've seen that where uh, the systems don't work correctly. So everybody's you know, using what they call off the cuff systems, maintaining all these different uh, spreadsheets. And when you're trying to pull all the data together, uh, you're not getting what you need out of the system because everybody, because of a lack of confidence in the system, everybody's got their own uh, spreadsheets and things like that. And it's, I, I've seen that firsthand and uh, it's really, uh, it can be a real, uh, a real disaster, okay. You really got to, um, it's, it, like I said, m many times, and that really gets back to, um, I talked about before, these are workarounds a lot of times when people are doing these kind of du double entry system because of a, either a lack of confidence in the systems and uh, they're, they're basically, uh, basically workarounds. Asset waste, of course, we talked about inventory, you know, overstocking, uh, underutilized resources, underutilized capital expenditures. So you build a plant and you're only using half the floor space. Well, that's a that's an underutilized uh, asset. Or you build uh, a, a huge conference room and it uh, hardly ever gets used, but still you have to uh, heat it and maintain it. So uh, uh, you know, so <clears throat> as part of um, 
part of leaning out a uh, part of leaning out is also making use of uh, in, a, in a lean project is also making use of the existing space. And if there is underutilized space, trying to find some other use for it or possibly uh, uh, disposing of that particular asset. And then, of course, unnecessary movement of uh, people. And these are uh, five S's, uh, just um, as far as keeping uh, the organization uh, that sort, only essentials due to work are present in all areas and everything uh, has a specific home for it, specific tool. You're not spending time running around looking for tools. That's a uh, wasted motion. Uh, tool, no tools that are inadequate. Uh, areas clear both physical and direct line of uh, sight barriers. And of course, in a, uh, in a manufacturing environment, that's a major uh, that's a major safety issue. And stabilizing a uh, place for everything: tool presentation, identification, and, lo and location. A good example there is. Um, the Coast Guard has a uh, repairs uh, helicopters and other types of aircraft down in our uh, base at, in Elizabeth City. And every tool has a uh, home for it, okay, has a particular peg hook or just a specific spot in a tool chest. At the end of a shift, if one of the tools is, uh, if there's an empty peg hook where a tool was supposed to go or an empty slot where a tool is supposed to go, nobody goes home until they find it because that tool could be in an engine and that which could lead to catastrophic results. So uh, 5S is also a, uh, an important safety uh, feature. And shine, uh, area is visibly clean and free of debris. And uh, that not only goes for the manufacturing floor, also for, uh, for an office environment too. And then standardization, everything's in the same place. Um, Work instructions are clearly written. The operator knows the location of work instructions. And then the uh, work instructions are posted in work areas. And there is, um, so everybody is, uh, so the, you have uh, work standardization. Also makes it easy to train new, uh, new employees. And then sustain, where it just uh, make it a, uh, develop some kind of a maintenance program to make sure that uh, that um, everything is uh, neat and orderly and that the uh, that 5S is maintained. In other words, after it's all been cleaned up and straightened out, there's some kind of a program to uh, to maintain it. We actually uh, did uh, we actually did a 5S in our office and uh, Got it somewhere here, and we actually made it into a morale event, and it was it was very uh, very successful. Let me uh, show you what we did. This is a few years ago, yeah, so this was in an office environment. Yeah, so like I said, we did. It was we took did this almost like a whole day. So you can see uh, before and after pictures, we actually had co contests for the best cubes. See, in this one, they both look pretty neat, but at least in this one, they're, they're, yeah, there's an inbox there so people would know where to go for a certain, uh, for a certain uh, document. I got another one here. So here's some good uh, examples. And there it is. Sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain, the five S's. So these were some of the before pictures of some of these cubes. And you can see there's, you know, you, it's just stuff all over the place, a real disaster. And uh, everybody came in in their work clothes, cleaned the place up. As you can see, everybody got down on their hands and knees. Oops. A lot of uh, trash. We found a lot of excess inventories. We were able to uh, bring those back to the uh, supply locker, saved a few dollars on, uh, on expenses, on supply expenses. 
So again, before and after. And we, like I said, these were the best cubes. So anyway, so uh, it uh, it was a nice uh, it was a nice morale event. And uh, did they sustain it? Well, eh, sorta. Anyway, now turn to the current state map, and we kind of saw that in a previous uh, sort of previous slide. So basically. Uh, your typical steps is you document the customer information, possibly by talking to the customer, doing a quick walkthrough, filling in the data boxes like you saw before, uh, document supplier information, how the information flow uh, works, how, do, how does each process know what to make next, how do they get the order in, how it flows through the system, uh, how the, where the material is being pushed, and then quality production time versus production lead time versus processing time. So that's the current state map. And then um, as far as the value stream map, uh, you want to choose a product or a service or a family of products or service that is causing the most concerns for your customer. So that's, once again, goes back to your voice of the customer. So you're going to follow the service from the customer end through the uh, process till eventually uh, uh, it's delivered to the customer. And then you want to create a uh, map of the future state where you've implemented, uh, maybe through Kaizen events, implemented some process improvement. And uh, most importantly, create and implement a plan to minimize the cycle time and reduce uh, resource use. Make your process not only uh, effective, but uh, efficiency, efficient. And then look at the map and for opportunities to remove uh, wasted effort, time delays, and all the other non-value added activities that we've been talking about. So uh, these are some examples of uh, opportunities for improvement, service world, and unnecessary approvals, overproduction of reports, handoffs, errors, waiting times, batch processing. I'll give you an example with, uh, with batch processing in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of accounting. Um, we would, uh, <coughs> our accounting operations department, we would uh, uh, post accounting entries using a batch process. So what would happen is at the end of the month, we'd be putting all these transactions in to close out the books. And in some cases, there might be 100 to 200 uh, transactions in a batch. It's, you know, that's the last day of the month, we want to close out, everybody goes home. So... What happens is you put all these uh, transaction and transactions in, and all of a sudden they don't balance. So somebody has to go through those 100 or 200 uh, different transactions to find out which uh, which one is um, which one is out of balance, which obviously takes a lot of time. So that's an example of. Um, kind of one of the evils, uh, an example of the evil in batch processing, you don't always know where the defects are. So eventually we changed the policy where there could be no more than 25 transactions in a batch. So at least if one of them was out of bounds, it was a lot faster to, uh, to find. And obviously the, in the ideal world, there would have been no batch processing at all, but we weren't at that stage then. So, um, so that's an example of one in the, in the uh, trans in, in manufacturing, in the, uh, in the finance area. And of course, in manufacturing, batch processing, you might be uh, uh, manufacturing a bunch of uh, chairs, you know, maybe 100 to a batch, but you don't realize till they're ready to be shipped out that one of them or, or they're all defective. So that's why we try to, uh, we're trying to move away from batch processing because it's very easy to hide uh, errors and defects. So in the manufacturing world is rework, overproduction, you know, just, just the waste that we uh, we've been talking about before, and the worst kind of uh, really the worst kind of uh, uh, is a is an external failure where the product has reached the customer and the customer has found the uh, found the defect, whereas uh, if it's an internal type of defect, at least. Uh, through your inspection process, you found the, uh, the, the defect. So, like I said, the, the worst kind of uh, error defect is where uh, it's external, where the customer actually finds it. 
and that's also the most expensive type to uh, to repair and to rework. So, okay. So this is the uh, basically the components of a business process. You, it's kind of like your SIPOC, your suppliers, your input, process, and your output. Okay, your customer. So that's no, no different than uh, you've already done with your uh, with your uh, with your SIPOC. So these are the elements of a business process, your inputs, the tasks and activities that transform those inputs into an output product that meets customer requirements, okay? So you got the input, and then all the different components of the input give you a, pro a product that meets customer requirements. But the uh, tasks and the activities are transforming that input into the output, into a product uh, that meets customers' expectations. So this is just an example of a, uh, a layout of, of course, Ford was the uh, pioneer of mass production, and they spent a lot of time developing this uh, assembly line. I mean, they were the first mass producers, and uh, one year they produced 250,000 uh, vehicles per year, which was uh, pretty amazing. But it helped. It was pretty simple. There was one model and one color. You could have any color you wanted as long as it was black. So it, it, had, the, it had the advantage of being a, a very simple type of uh, operation, comparatively speaking, where now, of course, most car manufacturers have many different uh, models. So uh, when the production was uh, went up to two and five uh, vehicles and different models, it uh, actually actually made the uh, product uh, added, added more co co complex complexity and the productivity consequently went uh, lower and you can see here they actually did a little spaghetti diagram to track the movement in the different uh, in the different processes things going from the furnace the waiting booth and so on so this is where a good spaghetti diagram of a process can uh, help um, even idea of uh, of excess uh, motion and uh, transportation and where uh, and being able to track it and that's a spaghetti strap a spaghetti uh, chart okay so once again that's used to uh, track uh, track motion and uh, you would might have to to do it you might have to follow somebody around uh, that are actually working in the process and actually go out, take a uh, diagram or schematic of the factory floor and actually just follow uh, follow the process around and be, and be able to do it. But it gives you an idea of, uh, of the amount of uh, motion and transportation. And these are just uh, identifying the different uh, product streams. And the simpler is obviously the uh, better. Very, okay. Any questions, comments? As you go through those things, uh, um, the, the waste. Yeah. Um, I noticed that some of them are, a lot of them are interrelated. Yes. Because looking at my own organization, I can definitely see the process waste, information waste, and asset waste and as part of the issue that we've been dealing with and trying to change some of those processes in order to you know cut down on um, a lot of things that have been bogging us down so I definitely can see how you know it's not just one thing within an organization you can definitely depict you can definitely find many of those ways and try to find ways to mitigate them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you, usually if there's one, you know, we, we talked about the seven wastes and that's a, you bring up a good, uh, you, you bring up a good point, uh, Judith, because uh, if there's a uh, one waste, maybe overproduction, it's probably, 
interrelated with other wastes, uh, you know, over underutilization of assets, um, and uh, uh, and it may link with uh, underutilization of people, uh, overproduction, and things like that. So, yeah, they're probably it's probably very rare where uh, you have one of these wastes that are totally isolated. There's usually some kind of a uh, interrelationship. And as you dig down deeper and uh, and drill down deeper, you'll uh, you'll find them. And uh, many cases, uh, you might be able to uh, get to the root cause and maybe uh, eliminate uh, more than one uh, particular uh, waste factor. But there's uh, they're usually symptomatic of something that uh, really needs some uh, major uh, major changes. I mean, you have, have it. I mean, if you have excess inventory all the time. Uh, certainly, uh, one approach to use would be the five whys. Why do we have excess inventory? Why are we? Uh, why don't we have confidence in the supplier? And uh, when you have excess inventory, uh, once again, you may have to have people working to uh, keep the uh, stock area uh, straight. That might be underutilization of people. So that, yeah, very good point there. Anybody else? Okay, what I'd like to do now, we're going to go ahead and uh, if any, anybody else has any questions on this, we're going to go ahead and move the part uh, to the second lesson. But what I'd like to do is um, is a video that I'd like to show you that kind of uh, gives you a nice overview of lean. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let me pull the uh, second slide out. Okay, that's out. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this video. It's about eight minutes long, but it's a nice little uh, little overview. And uh, I've actually got a um, a list of uh, doing a little research, a list of uh, videos that deal with that deal with lean, and I will uh, post those to the um, course materials. Uh, that way you could use them. It's a good resource, uh, if not for your project, maybe uh, for training in your uh, world of work or to increase your own uh, knowledge. But we'll go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and show you that first. So, okay. Lean is a term used to describe a process of analysis and creative problem solving. Many of its tools and techniques are derived from the manufacturing world and were blended into a specific methodology by upper level Toyota managers. Lean shifts an organization's focus to creating value for the consumer by shortening production. Can everybody hear it? Somebody? Uh, there's no sound from the video, sir. Well, I, I, I have it on pause now. But were you? Did you have any? Did you have any sound before? Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to double check. I wanted to make sure you got sound. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, well, go ahead and uh, start that. from the manufacturing world and were blended into a specific methodology by upper level Toyota managers. Lean shifts an organization's focus to creating value for the consumer by shortening production cycles, eliminating waste, and emphasizing efficiency. Employed the world over by business, healthcare, and government organizations, lean principles and practices can revolutionize the way an organization operates. So how exactly is lean defined? Lean is a systematic approach used to identify and eliminate wasteful activities within an organization through continuous improvement by finding ways to flow a product at the true demand of the customer. Wow, for a relatively short statement that has a lot of elements, let's break it down and examine the parts. Lean is a systematic approach used to identify and eliminate wasteful activities within an organization. Waste is considered anything that doesn't add value to a good or service in the eyes of a consumer. But when exactly is value added to a product? Imagine a customer looking over your shoulder while you work. From their point of view, what actions you perform would they find valuable? 
they would probably only find value in actions that somehow change or enhance the finished product. Would they value you putting on protective coverings? Probably not, as they aren't getting anything tangible in return. Would they value you cleaning and checking the equipment you are going to use to produce the product? Probably not, as they aren't getting anything tangible in return. Would they value you measuring and marking before you cut or otherwise modify a product or a piece of a product? Probably not. They would only find value in the cut or modification itself. Would they find value in you storing the good in a warehouse before you sell it to them? Definitely not. They would consider those extra costs your expense for doing business. Fujio Cho, chairman of Toyota Motor Corporation, defines waste as anything other than the minimum amount of equipment, materials, parts, space, and workers' time, which are absolutely necessary to add value to a product or service. A customer actually finds value in a small percentage of the work you complete, typically around 10%. This doesn't mean the work you are doing doesn't have value to you. It's just not giving them anything tangible. The customer really only wants to pay for work in which they find valuable. And from their point of view, that's what they're doing. If a customer buys a computer, from their point of view, they are buying the machine and the work it took to tangibly make that machine. They don't factor in all the other costs associated with getting that machine into their hands. If you divide all of that work into two categories, work the customer is willing to pay for and work that they are not willing to pay for, it is easy to distinguish between value-added and non-value-added activities. What are some of the actions a customer is willing to pay for? If you're a welder, the customer pays you for when the electrode is melting the metal. All the activity before and after that single moment in time does not add tangible value to the finished product or service and the customer is not willing to pay for it. Think of yourself as a customer. Would you want to pay for the welder to gather the parts or would you consider that his cost of doing business? Look at the service industry. If you're a family doctor, in the eyes of a customer, they are paying you for the time you spend with them face to face. In their minds, they are not paying you or your staff for writing chart notes, researching new medications, cleaning your instruments, etc. Stop and think a moment about all the activities you do as part of your day-to-day -day duties and really assess which ones add tangible value to the final product or service. Figure what percentage of your workday you are actually generating value from the customer's point of view. Obviously, the value-generating steps are dependent on the non-value-generating steps. But can some of those procedures that do not add value be condensed or eliminated altogether? How can we work smarter to not only shorten production cycles and to free up more time, but to also save on the cost of unnecessary work? Through continuous improvement. In lean philosophy, continuous improvement is called Kaizen, a Japanese word that literally translated means change for the better. Lean practitioners are never satisfied with the status quo, always believing there is a new, possibly better way of seeing. By staying diligent, they are always looking for the ways to improve processes and rethink tasks. Small, incremental improvements can lead to revolutionary changes over time. Next time you perform a task, even a small one, pay attention to the details. Is there something you can change about the process that will make your job easier or faster? Select simple, obvious changes over complicated ones by finding ways to flow product. Flow is an important concept in Lean. There are many facets and applications of flow that we'll be discussing in later videos. But for now, let's simply discuss what flow means in the manufacturing world. After all, lean thinking got its start on the factory floor. Unlike mass production's batch and queue processing, where numerous copies of one piece of a product are manufactured at the same time and then stored together in a group until the next stage in the process is ready for them, lean flow is known for one piece flow. Instead of several pieces being moved along the production line together, just one piece at a time moves through. Ideally, this piece moves from process to process continuously, never having to wait in a queue to go through the next process. One piece flow considerably speeds up the manufacturing process, cuts down on storage and transportation work, and eliminates defects and damage that occurs from storage and extra transportation. At the true demand of the customer. Instead of mass producing products and creating inventory, 
lean practitioners create only what is ordered by a customer. In this way, the customer pulls the product from the producer. The producer creates only what is needed and transports it straight to the customer. They ship more frequently, but there is little to no inventory, so they're actually saving resources. The lean organization does not incur cost of storage, transportation to and from storage facilities, additional maintenance, and other resources that track and manage these extra steps caused by inventory. Also, product loss due to damage in transport and storage is greatly reduced. Allowing customer demand to pull a product from your organization provides a more balanced approach to supply and demand than a typical push scenario. A push system is unfortunately a common problem in today's economy. A company mistakenly believing they will save money manufactures larger batches of products and stores them, using aggressive marketing techniques to try and empty their warehouses. This way of doing business is a costly gamble that has brought too many organizations to financial hardship. That is the definition of lean. But to work properly, lean takes constant practice. Lean practitioners are diligent and tireless. They are constantly examining their work processes to find room for improvement. To quote an old cliche, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. With alignment to our customer as our benchmark, we'll never settle for less than our very best. To summarize, lean is a way of thinking a way of approaching management that promotes efficiency by reducing inventory, decluttering the work area, eliminating wait times and queuing, and which focuses all of its energies on giving added value to the customer. To a lean manager, getting the customer what he or she needs right when they need it is of the utmost importance. But how is such a feat achieved? Stay tuned to find out. Questions, comments? Uh, I have a comment. You know, with uh, the inv inventory part that he was talking about, you know, I agree with him and then I disagree. Like for our organization, we're kind of caught in a catch-22 because if you produce only what you need or what you order, that's the situation we're in now because we have aircraft parts and they break. Right. We don't know how many is going to break or when they're going to break. And our parts are breaking, and I guess they didn't anticipate the number that was going to break, and now we're waiting on parts that they don't even have yet. They haven't made them. And then again, we have parts that on other aircraft that I've been on that we stored in case they did break and they never broke. And then these parts sit there and they go bad or they're outdated. So we got a kind of a catch-22 situation in the military. Yeah, and um, you know it's it's not a one size fits all. Um, probably a lot of organizations are probably doing a hybrid of both a push and a, a pull system. And if it's an environment where the product is uh, is highly customizable, you know it's not a, a mass batus type of pro pro uh, product. Uh, the pu the pull system may not uh, work. May, may not work that well. It, it, I would I would say it's probably more of an ideal state, but uh, yes, there's uh, you know depending on the type of business that you're in and your um, and your particular customer base, it's uh, it may not uh, always uh, may not always apply. But it's uh, a um, I said it, it, it in many cases it may, it may be the ideal or the uh, or the desired uh, state. And you and uh, that organizations can work towards. Hey, anybody else? Like I said, uh, there's some pretty good videos with that series, and I will upload the. Um, this is what it looks like. I will upload that to um, to the uh, course materials, and uh, you could download them and do what. Uh, and use them for, uh, for whatever reason that they're uh, they're all online. Any uh, any other comments on that? Look, I thought it gives a pretty good overview of what we're trying to accomplish in this uh, in this class. Uh, uh, pull versus uh, pull systems, non-value add push versus uh, 
pull versus push systems, non-value added versus value added. They talked about uh, the, the concept of uh, Kaizen. And uh, so these are all concepts that uh, we'll, uh, we're, we're discussing and we'll be discussing. So anyhow, um, if there are other uh, questions or comment, we'll go ahead and move on to, uh, to lesson two. Once again, uh, jump right in. And uh, <clears throat> once again, uh, a little review of the seven de deadly wastes, okay? You've already seen them. And then the uh, eighth one is uh, utilization of uh, people. So uh, looking at this uh, picture here, uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what kind of waste do you uh, see in the, uh, in the graphic there? Or why would you think there is waste? Just if you just walked in off the street and saw that, what would you think? Uh, I could think two 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 different ways. It could be defects or errors, or over overstock inventory. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Anybody else? Kind of see delays. I don't will say yeah. waiting and delay. I think. Go ahead. And overproduction. Right. Yeah. So, um, sorry, was there somebody else? I want to cut anybody off. I was going to say pretty much all of them except for motion and use of people, maybe. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That you could probably even, uh, yeah, if you just came right in off the uh, street and looked at that, that would probably, could probably hit on all of them. Maybe the motion might be a stretch. And, uh, you know, and uh, even the use of people, uh, you know, why are they, they're not using people to straighten this out? So, yeah, they pro it probably hits on most of those uh, seven ways. And if you would, you would certainly uh, could apply almost all of them to that. Good. So uh, this I slide I included, uh, this is a, I don't know if anybody's seen this before, but this is a really good uh, way to remember the seven uh, wastes called uh, Tim Wood. Okay. And uh, the, the last one is uh, underutilization of people. So sometimes people will call it Tim Wood plus P. But uh, anyway, real good uh, memory jogger uh, using, the, uh, using Tim Wood. So uh, we talked about 5S before. Uh, these are just various housekeeping activities, uh, using adopting a continuous improvement and incorporating the work culture. Uh, and and I, you know, <clears throat> this could be an organization-wide activities. Activity sort out was unneeded, uh, set in order what must be kept, everything should be signed, and have and establish a cleaning schedule. Uh, standardization and provide employees with training and make sure you sustain uh, sustain the gain uh, have some kind of a, uh, a schedule set up where uh, there's five s is done periodically and uh, of course it's uh, the, the safety part uh, you can't quantify that and, and it's especially in a factory uh, very important that uh, Five S is done, as I'm, I told you about the helicopter repair example before. Plus, uh, you know, if if if, uh, if um, areas where there's dangerous equipment aren't properly uh, marked uh, or access is restricted, uh, you have a workplace injury or worse. So, these are just some examples of uh, of Five S. Uh, Basically, uh, you want to use uh, apply some good uh, control techniques to eliminate erosion of improvements. So that might be part of your control plan in a 5S environment. What's your control plan for maintaining the uh, maintaining a, a neat and orderly workplace? And also in a uh, in an area where there's a good uh, 5S environment. You have uh, you can easily keep an eye on uh, on inventory. Okay, you have a uh, you have a one spot or one area where there's inventory placement, so you can keep an eye on that inventory, and you don't have uh, 
uh, a necessary buildup of inventory that it's uh, constantly being monitored to that. But also, you could apply that towards a, a good uh, 5S environment. So, uh, visual controls, um, basically information is made available at a glance, uh, point of view storage for locating parts, raw materials, and they're, they're as close as possible to the uh, where they're being used in the factory that would be in, in the production line. And if you're, as you're uh, in your Toyota production system, those Kanbans are right at the, uh, right, right at the uh, production line. So there's very little motion. And um, so that's a really good example of uh, a real good example of point of view storage, and then quality uh, quality at the source where it's designed and not inspected out. Okay, that's one of the uh, fundamental ta tenets of a, a quality first organization where it's designed in and not inspected out. Okay, one of uh, Deming's fourteen points. And you want effective visual controls, um, so uh, to ensure standard work and in uh, support environment, uh, indicator panel. Uh, so in this particular case, they have an on light that indicates flow schedule or quality st status. So maybe as the uh, when there's a green light, maybe the production moves downstream. Where there's a red light, it it, it stops for whatever reason. So. Many different examples of uh, visual controls, and I'm sure you've all have them or have seen them in your uh, in your particular uh, work area. Okay, quality is designed in, not inspected out. Okay. So, in a uh, visual factory, to implement a visual factory uh, type of environment, uh, you want to have a map identifying the access ways, aisles, entrances, walkways, and the action areas. And it's also good uh, for safety reasons in case there is a, uh, a uh, an evacuation of the building where people would know exactly where to uh, where to go. Um, perform any necessary realignment of walkways, aisles, and entrances. Uh, assign an address to each of the major action areas and uh, carefully mark off the walkways, aisleways, and entrances, and uh, basically and also mark off the uh, areas where there may be uh, dangerous uh, equipment. And, and also perform any necessary realignment of action areas. Uh, once again, mark off the inventory locations. Mark off equipment, machine locations, storage locations, and color code the floors in respect and, and different uh, action air, action areas. And that could also be done in a uh, in an office uh, office environment. Also, many of these things apply to uh, to offices also, not just uh, in a factory. So you saw in the in the uh, in the uh, in the video the push versus uh, versus pull. So in a, a production system, uh, the, that signal delivery from upstream stations are known as a pull production system, and that is that is the ideal state. As you know, as we as was discussed before, it may not apply to, uh, it won't apply to all organizations. May uh, it depends on the uh, type of processing that's done, depends on the uh, business model, and uh, also if it's a if it's a, a highly customizable type of a product, it may not work. But production system which push materials on downstreams are known as as uh, as push production systems, and that's we're trying to get away from the from those from the push production systems, which many cases lead to excess inventory and excess wait time, into more of a uh, pull system that's uh, centered on uh, customer demand and standardized uh, working. So in a, a traditional pull system, uh, material is moved downstream after processing in each stage, work and process, and you have a work and process inventories. And as you saw on that value stream map, when you have these work and process inventories, of course you have inventory buildup, and you also have a wait time, consequently leading, uh, which is a major uh, non-value added uh, activity. And um, if, yes, uh, certain efficiency measures encourage overproduction. 
where they may want to measure because they may be measuring his output per man hour and things like that. You know, the more products uh, produced per man hour in some cases might be a metric of, uh, of success. But it does would encourage overproduction. If your goal is as a worker to produce 50 widgets and uh, and you're producing 60, whether they need it or not, you might be recognized as a uh, as a hero. So basically, it's to keep all machines and keep people as busy as possible. Okay, but once again, yeah, we're talking about uh, then uh, having potentially having a uh, inventory. Uh, piling up and just having a whole warehouse of uh, finished goods, which is also inventory too. You know, we have work and process inventory, but you also have finished goods inventory also. And you certainly don't want a warehouse of finished good inventories also, because if it's not moving, it becomes obsolete, just like a whip or work and process inventory. So in a pull system, <clears throat> uh, basically it's pulled because it's a response to a signal from a downstream process. So they should, you should be able to minimize your, your whip uh, buildup. You should be able to reduce space requirements. You don't need as much uh, uh, warehousing for inventory. And, uh, but it also uh, relies on good, uh, 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 on a very dependable supplier, uh, having very dependable supply, suppliers to provide the goods. Uh, the uh, the supplies needed at the right time, at the right place, at the right price. And the emphasis there is on throughput and not necessarily efficient measures. So production per man hour would not be as important as the amount, as the uh, throughput through the, uh, through the system. Probably uh, when I was, uh, a few weeks ago, I was, uh, we're in Europe and we were in, um, we're in Poland, which uh, was under communist rule up until uh, 1990. And uh, the communist uh, command, uh, econ what they call a, it's called a command economic system, was probably a, a, a really good example of a push system. Uh, for instance, they would, uh, at the very top, somebody would make the decision, they would have a five year plan, we will produce. 1 million refrigerators, okay? Wasn't based on customer, uh, it wasn't based on customer demand or customer requirements. We will produce 1 million refrigerators. And when that factory produced a million refrigerators, even if they were defective or sitting in a warehouse, uh, the uh, plant manager would, uh, would get uh, recognized for it. So that's uh, probably an extreme example of a, uh, of a push system. It did the same thing with uh, with uh, automobiles and other types of consumer products. It was a push system and it had uh, no basis on, uh, it did not relate at all to uh, customer, uh, customer requirements. So uh, materials resource uh, process, uh, uh, MRP, I always forget that, material, uh, Somebody help me out with that. Material uh, requirements uh, process uh, reduces production schedules, and it's basically a uh, basically a push system. And whereas uh, trust in time inventory is a uh, is a classic pull system, uh, and um, you, uh, that is units are actually pulled through the entire system based on request, as we saw before. It's, uh, it doesn't move until it's uh, you, until you receive a signal from a downstream uh, downstream process. Once again, the MRP system, materials requirement uh, uh, system, uh, can tend to lead to an excessive amount of uh, inventory and work in uh, process. But uh, many organizations still use it, and in some cases, it's uh, it, it's it's ne it's absolutely necessary. So basic classic uh, production design briefs. Uh, so uh, in uh, push production systems, in a, in a push system, you have uh, workstations uh, in, a, in a process, but they're totally independent of each other. Every worker is always kept working at their maximum capacity. 
uh, once again, they want to keep the machines. The, the, the thinking there is keep the workers and the machines running uh, as much as possible because if they're not running, uh, the, the feeling is they're not they're not getting their uh, return on investment, and nobody wants to pay for uh, idle uh, idle time or idle uh, labor hours. <clears throat> But it does ignore the realities of simple uh, of systems thinking. So uh, basically, in a, uh, in a in a pull system, all the different uh, there's better communications and there's a continuous flow. So um, and the workstations are they're connected by common systems of uh, uh, common system objectives. So they're all working uh, in relation to achieving. A, a singular goal instead of uh, just making just in other words just in, instead of uh, the, the machines and the work is being kept busy making products that there are service products that may not be uh, may not be needed so it's kind of a I would say you know for a lot of organization that would be a major cultural change uh, going from a, a system where you want to make sure the machine is always busy and the people are always busy to one where uh, you have more of a pull system and you're not necessarily running the machines until they're actually needed. And at the same time, if there is, uh, if some of the if some of the workers are temporarily idle, are temporarily idled, they may be able to do other uh, other tasks in the uh, in the plant or in the uh, workplace. So maybe you can even use that time for additional employee training. So in a pull system, uh, the, the characteristics are the material is pulled through the system only when needed, uh, whereas in a uh, tra tra traditional pull system, it's pushed according to a schedule. And uh, in a pull system, it forces cooperation among the different work units. And ideally, and I emphasize the word ideally, it prevents over and under production. Like I said, for, for uh, a pull system may be a uh, desired state. You may not quite get there, but it's something you want to try to, uh, to achieve. So that's a kind of a model of a push versus a pull system. A uh, push system is based on an outside scheduling, the job, and then the production process. In a pull system, it's based on demand request from either an internal or an external customer. <clears throat> and it's not pulled until the, uh, the until there is an actual request for the uh, for the uh, for the item for what's being manufactured. So the basic advantages of pull systems. Um, they both have uh, advantages and disadvantages, and uh, like I said, I think most organizations probably have uh, uh, <clears throat> that use a pull system. Probably still also use a push system. So I don't know that there uh, <clears throat> you, you could go completely with a pull system because you do have uh, many organizations have seasonal demands, or in the case of aircrafts. Uh, parts you may it may be highly customizable or it may be absolutely required to have a, a safety or a buffer stock uh, on on hand. So uh, the MRP over the just the advantage of a pull system uh, MRT takes forecasts for end product demand into account where uh, there's substantial variation of sales. So yeah, if you're in a se very seasonable type of a business, MRP still may be the uh, still may be the answer where you don't have a steady uh, steady demand. But uh, the advantage of uh, just in time over uh, material resource planning, uh, it reduces the the big advantage is it reduces inventory and work and process and in a, in a uh, minimizes it and that certainly reduces uh, carrying costs. So that's the really the major advantage. Is a, is a reduction of uh, inventory and work in process. Yeah, so basically uh, you're, you're just concentrating only one and producing only what is necessarily necessary, uh, linking independent supply systems, decision and action and actions, and it should be visually responsible and it should be relatively simple to uh, manage. And once again, also reducing uh, Excess inventory, reducing waste time, wait time, and uh, work and uh, and uh, inventory. 
push scheduling is more of a traditional approach. So trying to go from a push to pull scheduling uh, may also be a, a, a matter of change management and 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 and, uh, organiza uh, and uh, organizational uh, change sh shift in culture. And once again, creates excess inventory. Pull scheduling is better coordination, uh, uh, production coordination. It's driven by demand. Using visual triggers, you know, maybe stop, go, as it moves as the uh, as the product moves downstream. But it needs uh, demand. Uh, but the uh, the one uh, hang up there is it uh, it needs uh, it can there's a lot of uh, d demand variation. It may not uh, it may not work. So. There are certain types of industries that are there where there's a lot of demand variation. Uh, pull scheduling may not be quite the uh, may not be the answer. Doesn't mean that you can't uh, implement certain elements of it. So the short term, a smooth pull loop re helps reduce inventory. Um, the near term, make to order with rapid response time and um, it eliminates uh, surprises for cons consumers and producers because you're not building uh, huge uh, batches of uh, of uh, product. Less chance of uh, defects uh, showing up. And um, <clears throat> just in time, it's just uh, basically uh, continuous and forced problem solving. Supplies uh, and components are pulled through the system. Toyota production system, uh, excellent example of an organization that uses just in time. I mean, they uh, literally they they uh, when they need a part, it's virtually delivered right to the factory floor into their kanban, so that the uh, uh, ideally the uh, the production line never runs out of uh, parts because they're constantly being uh, replenished and brought right to the uh, right to the factory floor. And in uh, just in time, you're only producing the product the customer wants. Consequently, that's uh, that's one of the key elements of a pull system. Uh, produce products only at the rate that the customer wants them. They're produced with perfect quality. Minimizes lead time, which minimizes non-value added activity, and it uh, produces products that uh, features what the customer wants, using making effective use of the voice of the customer. Creates flow production. You have one piece flow. Uh, in some cases, small and inexpensive equipment. Yeah, I mean, you, usually there's a U cell layout counterclockwise in each of the different uh, work areas. Work cells are talking to each other and communicating with each other. <clears throat> Multi process handling workers, uh, moving uh, easy moving and standing operations, and and most more more important most importantly, uh, there's you have a set standard operating uh, procedures. <clears throat> Processes are easy to understand. Uh, when you're not working in a batch environment and you're only producing what's needed, the uh, quality issues are apparent immediately. Whereas if you're producing uh, batches of products, uh, it's very easy to hide uh, defects until, uh, may, until possibly they uh, reach the customer. But in a uh, where you just have a pull system, you're not you have that big buildup of in inventory, so it's easy to spot uh, defects or other problems. And of course, uh, TQM is a uh, is a big component of that. Key is is to uh, minimize inventory. And this is something I included, in, and uh, lean is not just for manufacturers, so. There was doing a little research, and there's a uh, company called Zara. It's a uh, Spanish, it's an international uh, Spanish clothing company, and it's the largest fashion retailer in the world. I don't know, did anybody ever hear of it? But anyway, um, they're in some of the major, they're, they're in a lot of the major malls in this country, and of course, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, at least in Europe and uh, Asia. I'm not sure about uh, I'm not sure about Africa, but um, give you an example how they apply uh, in their own way. They apply uh, lean and and, and pull and uh, and a pull system. 
they uh, they <clears throat> they use just in time uh, use a just in time methodology. So twice a week, store managers order clothes, and twice a week on schedule, the new garments arrive. And uh, and the way they do this is they control they control most of its manufacture more of its manufacturing than most retailers. I call that vertical integration. So whereas a lot of manufacturers uh, might be importing their clothes, you know, from uh, you know China and Vietnam and places like that, which take a lot longer lead time, they have their own factories, reduces the amount of lead time, whereas they can respond to customer uh, demand a lot faster than uh, mo most other retailers. Because when you're ordering uh, merchandise from China or places like that, shoot, your lead time might be six months to a year, whereas they, they own their own factory, so their lead time might be uh, two or three weeks. And in the fashion industry, that's very important. And, and, uh, and they use agility. They have their own uh, factories in Spain, and most of them are automated. And they have, uh, 300, they have finishing factories in North Africa and Turkey to constantly create unfinished products. So, and uh, this minimizes markdowns. And in the retail world, if you can minimize markdown, you're going to increase your profit. So they can basically spin on a dime and, re and respond to customer demand on on fast moving items a lot faster than most other retailers and they use the they use a kanban system just like uh just like um toyota they uh they have the 1000 designs every month based on in-store sales and current trends and it monitors yeah uh, how much the customers are spending and uh, then it updates its uh, next design uh, accordingly so they are also uh, relying on a sophisticated, or we call it big data, but they obviously have a very sophisticated uh, uh, system for gathering data. So I just point this out that uh, these uh, these concepts are not limited just to manufacturing, but there's been some very successful service and retail-oriented companies that are uh, obviously uh, using it. So uh, quality must be high in those types of uh, for ju for just in time in the Kanban system. Um, um, of course, poor quality items is uh, wasteful, and uh, the workers are responsible for uh, inspection and production quality. And the key there is to never um, never pass along a defective item. And uh, Toyota production system, as you should. Uh, any uh, worker on the line can stop the uh, can stop the uh, manufacturing process if they see something's wrong, and that goes along with the philosophy of never passing along a defective item. Stop the production line if you have to. So they're uh, basically uh, in a value stream. There's uh, three types of flow. The material flow is the movement of material through a process. You know, those might might be the inputs, the raw materials. The information flows, the movement of information to the process, telling the process what to do next, okay? How much uh, you need, how much you need to produce. Um, and uh, and basically, information also be what the customer demand is and how, uh, and how people work, do their work in the system. So what would be, what do you think is more important in this type of environment, information flow or material flow? Any thoughts on that? Pardon me, you kind of, I got cut off there. All right, we'll move on. So in a continuous flow lineup, all the steps that truly create values so that they occur in a ra rapid sequence. So in a good continuous flow uh, environment, you're minimizing the amount of uh, non-value added activity. So every step in the process must be capable, which is a Six Sigma concept available to run and to have the capacity to avoid uh, bottlenecks. 
So in standardized work, uh, you have the tack time, which we'll get into later, matches the time to produce a product, uh, standard in process inventory, minimizes the number of parts, uh, reduces complexity, complex, complexity, standard work sequence, and the order in which workers perform these tasks. And it's constantly being evaluated and improved upon. So in uh, production smoothing or leveling, averaging both the volume and production time. And a mixed model line, and uh, Toyota is a great example of that. So Toyota makes three Macar models, a convertible, hardtop, and an SUV. Assuming their customers are buying nine convertibles, nine hardtops, and nine SUVs each day, what is the most effective way to make these cars? Anybody have any uh, thoughts on that? I'd probably say SUVs first, hardtops second, convertibles last. Yeah, actually, it's interesting because actually Toyota is right now, they're, they're experiencing a shortage of uh, SUVs. They kind of um, misdiagnose uh, the market. And uh, right now, there is a shortage of the RAV4 or RAV5, RAV4, I think it's called, and the Highlander, which are their two top selling SUVs. And uh, right now, if you were going to go out and buy a uh, Toyota vehicle, you could probably get a pretty good deal on their um, sedans like their Camry. But their SUVs, you, you might have might have availability problems. So even companies like Toyota make a, um, you know, make, uh, you know, make mistakes. So I don't know. You know, that's probably probably a lot of different ways you could uh, uh, look at this. Uh, you know, be able to solve this issue uh, probably through some kind of a pull system, maybe devoting um, a certain amount of plant time, uh, maybe depending on the complexity of each of the vehicles. Uh, you may, uh, if an SUV is more difficult, com uh, more complex to build, you may devote uh, maybe to produce that first. So I don't know if there's a right or a wrong way to do that. But I do know that they definitely... Uh, Missed, uh, missed the mark on uh, on on SUVs. Although they're uh, apparently their their profit level is still uh, they're still doing well. They had a they uh, they had a good uh, good quarter. But if you're looking for a good deal on a Highlander or, or a uh, Rav4, it might they you may not be able to get one because uh, they're in the uh, lack of uh, supply. At least that's what I. I read that in the Wall Street Journal the other day. So lean manufacturing, uh, you're looking to minimize need for overhead, which is a good thing. Uh, only producing what's necessary, linking supply system decision is action, and uh, determining what needs to be visual, responsible, responsive, and easy to manage. But uh, an effective uh, just-in-time system should be able to help uh, minimize over time and to also minimize uh, waste, especially in the area of inventory. And, and we, these, and you should be familiar with these. Uh, these are the type of metrics that are used in uh, lean uh, cycle time, and we'll go through these in more detail. Uh, but all these, most of these terms are used in uh, in value stream mapping. The cycle time. It's usually the amount of time that uh, in a particular process or sub-process. So, so if, for instance, if, uh, if a uh, part has to be welded together, so if the welding time takes 15 minutes, that would be the cycle time. And then the changeover time might be moving, uh, changing the machinery from one product to another. The lead time is the entire amount of time from the time that the order is taken to the time it's shipped out. That's the entire lead time in the whole process, both value-added and non-value-added time. On the, uh, uptime is the on-demand machine uptime, production batch sizes, the number of opera operators per operation, pack size, working time, scrap rates, tack time, process time, value-added time, non-value-added time, and wasted. These are all uh, lean process measurements. You should uh, A lot of people get uh, cycle time and lead time confused. Uh, cycle time is the amount of time 
a um, that a certain uh, amount of time that a certain process takes. Lead time is the amount of time for the entire for the entire uh, from the time it enters the uh, from the time that it's cut the the, uh, the orders received from the customer to the time it's shipped out, both value added and non value added time. Cycle time is more or less the value added uh, time. Lead time is how long, yeah, so there you go. Lead time is how long the entire process takes. Those are different sub-processes, and it includes value-added, non-value-added, and um, value-added activity. There's also, they call it PNVA, but there's also um, what, they, what I would call business non-value-added, where there are certain um, um, process steps or certain processes that are non-value-added but because of legal requirements have to be part of the uh, process. So it may very well be, for instance, in a, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing environment, there may be an additional uh, inspection step that has to be done. It may not add value to the customer, but it's, it's, it's legally required. Uh, so, so some non-value added activities are uh, have to be uh, be included in the process because they may be uh, mandated by regulation or law. And this is the process time. So here, here we're looking at the entire lead time. This is the entire time for the whole process to take place, okay? So the process time, so in this particular case, in step three, this is, uh, it gets, it's moved into step three, then there's a the wait time, okay? between step two and step three. And then once it's in step three, the actual process time is when it's gathering data and creating the docu document. So that's the process time. And in many cases, that's the value added time. The rest of it, the wait, the move, is probably non-value added time. So it may very well be that the wait time might be, you know, could be 30 or 40 days. The process time might be 10 minutes, okay? Usually the uh, so the cycle time is how frequently an item or a document is actually completed by a process step. Okay, so in this particular case, this is the entire cycle time. You know, actually, yeah, this is the entire cycle time, but the actual process time is where the uh, you, you're gathering the data, where you're, the work is actually getting done in step number three. You're gathering the data and creating the documents. So that's the process time, and that's where uh, kind of where the uh, um, where the uh, work is actually getting done. Whereas the move and the wait time is more is part of the cycle time, but it's more non-value added activity. So if you were looking at step number three, you would try to minimize the amount of move and especially the amount of wait time. So this is the, so this is important. The uh, cycle time, the process time within the uh, within the cycle time, but of only of each of these. So each of these individual steps, each has their own cycle time, and they have their own process time. And uh, tack time is the measure of customer demand, and uh, basically the tack time is the uh, is the available amount of time divided by the customer demand rate for uh, for available time. So the part demand is five, and uh, the tack time is two parts coming off the line every 10 minutes. So that would be your, uh, that would be your tack time. So the available time divided by the customer demand rate for available time. And we actually used it in our accounts payable department. We actually had a tack time that we established for payment of invoices. So uh, work balancing maximizes operator efficiency by matching work content to the tack time. Tack time is the rate at which customers require your product. And this is the way it's uh, calculated. The available work time per day. So it might be, uh, you know, uh, eight hours per day. And the daily required demand in parts per day. So 
and the available work time is eight and the daily requirement is two, your attack time would be, uh, would be six. So available work time per day divided by the daily required demand in parts per day. So the available work time was, was eight and the daily requirement uh, in parts per day was four. They would be able to, uh, the attack time would be two, uh, two per day. And uh, muda is the Japanese word for, uh, for waste. So these are measuring the uh, non-value added versus the value added activities. So all these acute times are all uh, non-value added activity. Those are the red areas and the green areas are the, probably the, uh, the, uh, the process times, are the process times. So the lead time for the process, which is the, uh, which is described by the, by the uh, title bar here, is, is represented by the black horizontal line. So that's a total of 35 days. Value added tasks and non-value added tasks are demonstrated by the green and red vertical lines where they occur within the process. And the white space along the horizontal line indicates where nothing, no activity at all is happening. And that's basically the wait time or the queue time. And remember that the waste is, uh, is, a, uh, is one of our major uh, waste factors. So you want to try to minimize uh, in, in looking at this process, you want to work on trying to minimize as much of the queue time as possible or wait time. And that's just an example of a time value map. And these are just uh, well, it's basically a review of what we've uh, gone through uh, before. So once again, we want to make the goal is to have a continuous flow, especially where you have a standardized type of uh, of uh, operation. Minimize the amount of uh, this this uh, the these uh, the inventory to where uh, in this particular case it's going through print, then it's in then it's in a, it's it's in a, to work in process, goes through the place port, work in process, and then uh, out the door. So uh, in the continuous flow process, you've eliminated this inventory. So you've got the, uh, the input is the unprinted boards and solder goes through the line and then it goes back to the customer. So uh, they, they've uh, eliminated by going to a pull system, they've eliminated the work in uh, process. And that's just a sample uh, flow. Uh, Good example of visual. You can see um, it's a good example of 5S. They've got uh, the different areas outlined in yellow, so you can it clearly uh, delimit delineates where the uh, manufacturing is going on and where the uh, walkway should be. So they use a you know use colors like yellow, which really uh, stand out. Tools are hung and organized. It's well lit, and it looks like in a very inviting. Looks like you can eat off the floor, and that's what you uh, want. All right, so that, uh, that does it. Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, if not, uh, for those of you who uh, observe the holiday, I'd like to wish uh, everybody a, a, a good Thanksgiving. If you're uh, traveling anywhere, uh, be safe. Um, like I said, I'll still be available if you uh, have any uh, questions or anything in the, uh, in the interim. So uh, as I did last time, I will uh, hang around in case anybody uh, wants to talk to me uh, individually. Otherwise, uh, once again, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, do this again in two weeks. All right. Safe and happy holidays to you, sir. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Yeah, the code for this session is 650. That's 650.